Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Well, from rocket engineers to Navy SEALs, the power of having highly skilled specialists on the job can yield remarkable results. The same is true in sales. Well, Chris Manitius is an expert in the art and the science of training and finding first and training million dollar producers. He actually works as the VP of Global Sales for Seventh Level Communications, founded by Jeremy Miner, the highly renowned author and trainer. And he, on the show today, he's going to show you and me exactly how we can do very much the same thing, find and train million dollar producers. Chris, fantastic to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I love that intro. I feel like I'm George Clooney on a TV show here. <laughs> well, uh, George Clooney, that's pretty tall order. Let's see if we can feel that one. How did you get involved with what you're doing? I always like to set it up. we got a great premise here today, uh, finding and training million-dollar producers. How would you get swept up into that? Well, so in 2020, I was running a business. It was a photography company uh, called PicStation. I still own it today. Uh, but that was my primary source of income. I was running this photo booth rental business that I built up from my apartment to be a national operation. You know, I had just hired my first employee about two months in, took a big step. We had just hit our first hundred thousand dollar month in revenue, which was huge. I mean, I didn't at this point, I didn't really have a big warehouse or anything like that. It was just really me and my apartment. Um, I think we had a small office at this point, but it, at any rate, the the what you all know happened is COVID. The the, the event industry specifically collapsed overnight. All my events canceled. People stopped booking events. So overnight I lost my livelihood. I thank God I had the critical insight that like, if my thing isn't selling anymore, I'm going to sell someone else's thing. And if it weren't for that insight, it wouldn't have brought me to sales, but that's how I ended up in sales. So what I did was I, I invested in my skills, my training, um, you know, with Jeremy and, and, and other trainers too, that were very good. Um, and, and learned skills really, really well. Got my first sales job, made a little bit of money, then got a better sales job with more opportunity. And then in my first year in sales, I made $300,000 in commissions. Total rookie. Not an accident. I was a top producer in my company. Uh, it's because I learned the right skills. So, and, and so I went from 2020, losing everything, living in an apartment, to buy my dream house two years later because of sales, because of learning the right skills. So today, I hope to be able to help your audience with just you know, understanding how to learn the right skills so they can excel at sales. That's a really powerful story. I love it. One of my mentors, uh, Chet Holmes, worked with him for years. He always talked about the great thing about skills, anybody can learn them if you're willing. Yeah. And uh, whatever your, 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 you know, your ultimate high point might differ from somebody else, but wherever you are now, you can get way better at it and enjoy the results of that. Well, the insights you're going to be sharing today about what it takes to become a seven-figure producer Um kind of come from the real world, right? You have sort of a case study that you'll be working from. Tell us more about that, if you would. Oh, yeah. So uh, so we trained specifically a, a guy named Shrikant. Um, uh, and, and by the way, we've trained like tens and tens and tens of thousands of sales reps at this point. And to back it up a little bit, so I'm with Seventh Level. So we're a sales training company. We train 158 industries, uh, including tech sales specifically. So we've trained people in tech sales. One guy specifically who I'm thinking of, who when he started learning from Jeremy, um, our, our chairman and founder, he went from making 80K a year in commissions to 900K a year in commissions, selling the exact same thing. He did that by learning the right skills, learning skilled questioning, all those things that we'll talk about later today. So that's just an example to show you the power of learning the right skills in sales. I think you're muted. It is a super powerful story, and um, it doesn't happen by accident. I think you said that a moment ago. There's definitely some specific steps that you took in training this gentleman. Mm -hmm. So let's say we found a rock star that we, we feel like they've got great skills, great personality, a lot of ambition. That's probably the most important one, being teachable being teachable, and having a lot of ambition. Those are probably the key elements, right? Sure. Because different personalities can, can succeed. But would you walk us through what are the key elements, and what did you do to work on those elements and hone them into, into, high, into a high-level skills with this individual? Yeah, so um, skills pay the bills. I see someone just commented that. So ambition is great. Motivation is great. It's not going to get you very far if you don't have skills. Okay, so you really have two options when getting into sales. Like number one, start a sales job. Hope you do well. Hope your personality takes you where you want to go or hope that you have the gift of gab. The reality is that that's, that's just not enough today. That stuff used to work maybe 20 years ago. You just talk someone's ear off until they bought. 
that doesn't work anymore. Consumers are different. They've changed. They're more skeptical. Um, and, and so then the modern sales producer has to act differently and do his job differently to, to be able to sell more effectively. So what I would say to that person, if like if you are an ambitious sales professional just starting your career, you have two options. Number one, give it a shot. See how you do. Realize you're not making the kind of income you want to, um, you know, five, 10 years down the road. And then finally, maybe do something about it. Or number two, just invest in training up front like I did, uh, like Shurkant did. Learn the right skills. Excel at your job quickly. Compress time. Get to the goal. And so what are some of the what are some of those specific areas that you need to work on to become that high level producer? Let's maybe make a list and then let's unpack each of those for the listener today if we could. Yeah, for sure. So like for for example, for like Shirkan. So he had he cold calls, which perhaps some of your listeners have sales teams that cold calls. On a cold call, tonality is huge. Uh, and if you don't have the right tonality when you cold call, What's the prospect going to do? They're just going to get rid of you because you just sound like a salesperson motoring through something. They're busy. They don't want to talk to you. So tonality is huge. So what sure can't learn how to do well, the first thing they learned was tonality. And I can give you an example. Typical sales rep. Hi, uh, hi, John. This is Chris with XIZ Company. You know, yada, 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 yada. And they just go into their spiel. What do most people do? They're like, oh, I'm not interested. They hang up. Uh, versus the new model salesperson that we call it, um, they're going to use tonality. So they would say something like, hi, do you want to role play with me for a second, Jonathan? Sure. Let's so, do it. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, yeah. What can I do for you? Yeah. Hey, this is, um, it, it just Chris. I was wondering if you could possibly help me out a moment. Um, okay. What can I help you with? Well, I'm not even quite sure you could yet. I, I'm calling to see if you would be open to looking at any hidden gaps in your X, Y, Z that may be causing you X, Y, Z really bad result. Would you be open to looking at that? We were just looking at our X, Y, Z recently. Oh, okay. So what are you doing right now about X, Y, Z? Pause. Right. So now yeah. in your opinion, being on the receiving end, how did that come Like, how did you feel about that interaction? Oh, you'd keep me on the phone. I mean, cause now I'm intrigued. Like all that, all that open air, and that super calm feeling coming across that was kind of almost mesmerizing. It draw it triggers curiosity because it uses human behavior to pull someone in, as opposed to like if if I just called you like hi John and this is Chris with XYZ Corp. I uh, you know and they just went into their thing. What are you probably going to do? Uh, I'm done. Like, I'm, I'm busy. Done. Yeah. Right? So the the key there is to not sound like a salesperson because if you sound like one, you're dead in the water, especially on a cold call. Okay. So that's the yeah. first thing we trained Shurkan on is tonality. Now, the second thing we trained him on was skilled questioning. Okay. The way we, we did that is by teaching him a sales structure that works in 158 industries, which is all of the industries. Okay. Teaching him how to have a skilled conversation. So what that encompasses is the connecting stage. That's the top of it. So that's the beginning of a discovery call, like where you take the focus off of you as the salesperson onto the prospect. Okay. It allows you to connect with them with zero resistance and disarm the prospect and ignite curiosity that pulls the salesperson in. So we taught Shurkan how to do that. The, we taught him situation questions. So it helps the prospect and the salesperson, but more importantly, the prospect find out about their current situation, problem awareness questions. Those are what open up the emotional door to find out what their problems are why they have those problems and how those problems are affecting them. Solution awareness helps the prospect understand what their future could look like if their problem were solved. Consequence questions helps the prospects question their way of thinking and explore the consequences of doing nothing. Then transition questions and then closing questions, which we call commitment questions, which are four questions that we ask to be able to close sales in a low pressure, non sleazy way that makes the client feel good, but also is has has a calm assertiveness to move the deal forward. So those are the things that we taught him. You know, a lot of what you're talking about feels to me like it's all about measuring your energy in a way, like really interacting in a way that isn't overly focused on pushing, but maybe pulling. Yeah. Is that is that fair? Exactly right. 
Yeah, I like that a lot. So when we're talking about being prepared for these different industries, it's it it it, it, it kind of begs the question. There's some back, you know, some home, homework that's required as well, and part of a really good sales professional, right? You can't just come to these calls and, and do it all on style, however skilled that style might be. You've also got to know about your industries. Do you have tips and tricks on that? What what are some keys to coming in, knowing your stuff? Are there some shortcuts? Well, I mean, I don't know if there are shortcuts. Doing a little bit of homework before an engagement is good. Uh, it'll help you understand and have some context. And more importantly, it won't like turn the business owner off if you don't know anything about them. So it's good to have some context, but um, a better, a, a good discovery is where you're going to get the real meat potatoes of what's going on. And I would argue that's more important than just looking at a website because you really want to understand what the problems are. Everyone puts their best foot forward on a website. It doesn't tell you what the problems are. So it'll, it can give you a little bit of information. It's not going to give you as much as you need. That's where skilled questioning is going to come in to help prospects open up. So they share with you what the problems are and how they're affecting them. Yeah, good stuff. By the way, a quick reminder to our live audience, uh, one of the great things about being live is you have the opportunity to interact with our guest. Uh, we're going to ask you to go ahead and put your questions in chat right now. We're going to bank those. And at the bottom of the half hour, we're going to have sort of an overflow Q&A session for another 10, 15 minutes. So go ahead and put those questions in or whenever they occur to you as we continue our conversation here today. Awesome. So, Chris, uh, as, as we're looking at the skill set, so we, we're, we've got tonality and we've got having a, a well-structured conversation. Maybe we could go a little deeper in. So let, let's let's fly down a little, little little bit lower altitude on these. Start start us out with sort of the 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 front end of, of these conversations. What should that look like? Okay. Well, for example, like a connecting question typically would be something that along the lines of like, okay, so. You know, what is, so it's top of the conversation. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So the first thing we're going to do is it's not going to be like, how's the weather over there? How are you doing? These are typical things salespeople do like prospects. No, you don't care. Okay. So we actually advise to not really build that much rapport in that way. Okay. Rapport we believe comes from the back and forth, a positive sales conversation that's productive. Okay. That's our concept of rapport. So a connecting question would be something like, so, you know, I was, so it looks like you booked some time in my counter talk about possibly, um, you know, getting X, Y, Z. Is that the case? Okay. What is it about what you saw about what we do or about this resources or about this podcast or about this ad that, that attracted your attention? Uh, oh, it was this and this. So immediately what that's doing is taking the focus off the salesperson and onto the prospect and allows them to kind of get into the zone of thinking about what they wanted in the first place. Okay. So that's a connecting question. Sit, and, and that's going to be like, and you're going to want to establish the overarching goal at the top. What is it that you're hoping to get out of possibly looking into this, situ this solution? Oh, I want to help my salespeople get better at sales so they produce more revenue. Okay, situation question. So what are you doing right now about that issue? Oh, you're doing this. And you find out some things about their situation, helps them understand their situation too. Problem awareness, do you like what you're doing about your, about, do you like what you're doing about what you're doing? You're going to find out what they like about it, if anything, what they don't like. If they say they like things about what they're doing, two truths question would just be, okay, well, sounds like things are going fairly well. Is there anything you would change about what you're doing about this if you could? No one likes 100% of what they have, so this is where you're going to find problems. And what we teach people to look for is what's the problem, how long has it been a problem, and you know what impact is the problem having? So those are the really the, the, the few main things that people need to look for, uh, that salespeople need to look for. And then solution awareness. Um, so before you found us, were you looking for a solution to, to solve XYZ problems so you could have XYZ result? Or what were you doing about this? Find out if they tried stuff, if they have baggage. That's good inf information to know if you're a sales professional. Um, ideal criteria. What would be their ideal criteria and a solution? Help the prospect imagine and participate with you in the, um, in the solution to your problem you know, and building that. And then the consequence of not solving the problem that would, an example of that would be like, well, Mr. Prospect, um, you know, have you considered uh, the possible ramifications of not doing anything about this? And, you know, this problem gets even worse. Like what would happen at that point? Skeptical, neutral, empathetic, key tonality there. So that's where you're going to help them build urgency. Oh, okay. But why do something about this now though? Like why not just circle back q3 q4 hope it just gets better on its own oh well because you know now and they're going to talk themselves into doing it now this builds urgency so that's in a nutshell what the sales structure is you know in a b2b environment you're going to 
Uh, then book a second call where you're probably going to do a demonstration of your product. And then you might do a proposal on that call or you might do it on the third call. But at least from the first call, that is going to help you build a business case for your solution to have leverage to be able to present that in a way that makes sense to the prospect to move forward. One thing that we one thing that we know about uh, these larger enterprise sales is that it's very rare that there is just one or two stakeholders, right? Is that the, there are teams involved and the mm -hmm. way decisions are made can vary. Um, what, what do you recommend in your training for the sales pro on that front to help a discern who are all the stakeholders? Cause that's not always immediately evident and B how can you shorten timeframes and get, uh, get all those folks into the conversation effectively. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways. So you, you want to do what's called stakeholder mapping in the conversation. So figure out like who else is concerned about a problem, who else is responsible for, for solving this problem. Um, and, and then, you know, at the end of the conversation on the first call, you know, you could say something like, okay, so, and by the way, like before we part ways, like who else is responsible for making sure that the, this problem gets solved? Oh, it's this person and this person. Oh, how do they fit in? Okay. And, you know, would it help you just so you don't have to like remember all the like the details of what we're going to be going over when you go to them, would it help you if you actually brought them on for our next appointment so that we could talk about the problems that you're having and how we'd be able to solve those? Would that help you more if, if they joined us? So getting them, you know, like to show up to the second call is is a great I, that's a great place to do it at the end of the first call or if if you're not able to do that at the end of the second call making sure like after you ask the commitment closing questions if that prospect is sold in that solution uh, and then we teach some objection handling on how to actually get them aligned with the solution and, and get other people to to come for a follow-up call to actually go over it with you so there's a couple places where you want to ask questions to do stakeholder mapping to figure out who else is there and do your best to get them on a subsequent call and uh, so what, what do you find, by the way, it's more of an industry wide question. It's kind of a sidebar question, but how long are these cycles typically with, with pros that you folks have trained? Um, are you, have you tracked that much? Are you just seeing any shortening of timeframes on decision-making? Yeah, we you have know, big enterprise deals can be, can, can take half a year or longer to, to go typically, right? So typically, yeah. When you build more urgency in the prospect sales cycles shrink because sales cycles fundamentally are linked to human behavior if the prospect hasn't realized the full scope of his problems and the consequences of not solving the problems, then the sales cycle is going to expand because the problem in his mind has not been as expanded as, his, as it could have been, right? As, whereas if a sales professional did his job really well or her job and found problems, built urgency, built a gap and built the consequences of not solving that problem, what do you think happens? Sales cycles shorten, right? Because there's more urgency yeah. there. There's more need to make a change. And that's, that's the job of the sales professionals to direct focus, build urgency so that these things happen. Well, and if you uh, are good at pointing out the pain points, you're more likely to shorten cycles as well, right? right. Going back to good old Jay Abraham, people are far more likely to uh, run from pain. Than they are to seek a, a, a benefit. Exactly right. Um, so, We've got a good overall sort of set of skill areas we work on. I understand that there at, uh, at, at seventh level, you guys have a methodology and there's an acronym NEPQ. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. Why don't you take us through that just in short form, if you would? Yeah. So it's neuro emotional persuasive questioning. So it's using behavioral science to help prospects persuade themselves because no one, like who is more persuasive? A, salesperson to a prospect or a prospect to themselves? Yeah. I think we all know the answer to that. When a salesperson says something to a prospect, it goes in one ear, out the other. When the prospect says that to him or herself, it's, it's part of them. That's what the methodology is based on, skilled questioning and using questions to be able to help someone come to their own, own conclusions. And the result of that is more sales, happier clients, and happier salespeople because sales is just easier and it's more fun and it's less combative, less stressful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, what, what are, what, what's the basis of this? Does this come from just a kind of human psychology, Jeremy Miner's own experience? Uh, what, what, what are the origins? Yeah. So Jeremy studied human behavior in college and, uh, he, 
you know, got a sales job because I think he was a young father at this point. He needed to make money, was not good at that sales job because no one's born a good, like a top sales professional. This is, these are learned skills. So he went back to his human behavior background, did a lot of studying on his own, read probably a thousand books, sought mentors. And then he developed this methodology over time that in his 20s, he was earning 60, 70, 80 K a month. And then eventually between two to three million a year uh, using this methodology that we've used to train 158 different industries. So it works in every industry. Um, as long as you're selling to people who have problems and your prospects have problems and they're not extraterrestrials. You can't help those people. Well, unless who knows? I mean, for all we know, there's a there, there's something going on. The government. I mean, there, there could be a, there could be a whole market about to open up there. We don't, we don't know. Yeah, yeah but that, that that's a different show. <laughs> different different podcasts altogether. Yeah. Um, so so that so it's basically it, it really is based on human behavior, and I like that a lot. Um, one thing that I think that could be a risk when you're talking about this idea of how to sell is it sounds like it could be manipulative, but the way you're role playing it for me during the program today it doesn't feel manipulative to me. It feels very calm and confident. Those are two things that most people find very attractive, especially when they're, you know, the rest of the world is so stressful. You're almost, it, it, it's a, it's, you're, you're creating a space for them to actually be pulled in. I think you're kind of doing someone a favor if you have something really good to sell anyhow. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? Do, do some of the trainees have to go through a learning curve on that and, and learn sort of this art and science of persuasion? Uh, how, how's that go with your trainees typically? Well, okay. So I think what you mentioned earlier, like, is it manipulative? Well, I think it's the job of a sales professional to sell things that are good, that help people and to use superpowers for the forces of good. Because yes, you, you could be highly persuasive and you could be someone like, I won't even mention names that uses persuasion to, to scam people out of money. That's not what we're about. We're about helping people, helping sales. We, we want to make sales great again. Okay, we want the profession to be looked at positively. <laughs> we want people to have positive interactions with salespeople uh, because salespeople are problem solvers. Uh, you know, there are many problems in the world wouldn't get solved if it weren't for a sales professional who had to go through a lot to get that deal done. So we are on a mission to help salespeople, uh, you know, be seen better in the marketplace, have an easier time with their job, get paid more, and then have prospects have better interactions with salespeople. I hope that answered your question. I think I got sidetracked. Yeah, I like it. Make sales great again. Yeah. We can get the hat. And uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the reality is nothing happens until somebody sells something. Some, something. I think that's a saying from many years ago in business and marketing. And it is absolutely true. And persuading someone to take action in their own best benefit, people have a hard time making a decision. So I think, you know, we're, we're fans of sales pros here on the Evolve Sales Leader. And I think the key, the key is to do it in an evolved way, which is what we're talking about here today. Sure. Well, Chris, for the next couple of minutes, if you would, what are some initial steps you could tell the listener to take if he or she would like to either A, make themselves a more of a seven-figure producer or B, train somebody to do that? Well, the first step would be to learn the right skills. And if, if you resonate with what I went over today, then it would be to learn any PQ. The way you could do that is we actually have a special offer for you guys. It's seven bucks, just some basic training. It's called the Any PQ Black Book of Questions. You could start getting a taste of the methodology, get some ideas that you can incorporate into your sales process. So that would be the first step. Our uh, Facebook page is Sales Revolution. We have, I don't even know how many people in there, 15,000, 16,000. Uh, so Sales Revolution on Facebook, it's the URL is salesrevolution.group. Join there. You can see, you know, it's totally free. You can see what sales reps are doing, how they're using NEPQ, what industries they're in. Uh, we do free trainings in there. Uh, so those are first steps I would take. And if this is something that you're serious about, like in terms of leveling up your own skills so that you can be top 1%, in your industry, like we've helped thousands of our clients do. If that's something you're serious about, then, you know, they can reach out to me. We can talk about our more advanced trainings, which the guy I mentioned earlier, sure can't, who we trained to make 900K a year. He did advanced training with us and it wasn't cheap, but I'm, sh he, I'm sure he couldn't be happier that he did it. Okay. But those little steps, just making sure it's a good fit, getting at least some training. So, you know, you're, you're effective at what you do. Yeah, I love that. One way to turn it around as well is, is maybe there could be a little analysis somebody could do on the call. Like, what are some of the key mistakes that are being made? Could you rattle off a few of those? The uh, Maybe the five or six things you might be doing wrong that, that, that would tell you you need an update on your skills. Well, if you're if you're talking too much, uh, if you're defaulting to, you know, you ask maybe one or two surface questions and you're pitching, pitching, pitching. 
that would probably tell me that would certainly tell me that you that you would need a skill set update um, because that tends to be what sales professionals do when they don't know what to do prior to that. And it's a natural thing to do. You just want to tell people about what you sell. So if that's what you're defaulting to, it's not as effective as, as, as what we do. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. If, um, you know, you're stuck in your head or you're freezing at a, you get an objection and you kind of freeze and you're like, okay, just call me back later or, okay, let me know. Uh, if you're doing these things or if you're getting to the end of the call and it ends and you don't know exactly what the prospect was thinking, you don't know why they didn't move forward. If you're, if you're having those types of issues, then I would say it definitely makes sense to get some training. If you're a sales leader and you're like, you know, I've tried everything with my team. They're just not hitting numbers. I know we can sell more. I don't really know what the problem is. Then, then you can reach out to me directly and I can help you with some possible, you know, team training options. Any of those things, you know, if you want your sales reps to be more effective, happier with the job, making more money, um, and you feel like they're just doing outdated stuff, like maybe the, the option close, like, do you want to do the red one or the black one? Okay, will it be Visa or MasterCard? If they're doing that stuff, it's probably not going to go very well. So you, you, you're, you're not a fan of the either or close. That's a, I thought that was a time honored tradition among sales. It's, 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 it's dated. It's dated. You, you heard it here first. It's dated. All right. It's time to move on. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking for, of time to move on, I think uh, we've covered some really good ground here, Chris, and I think it would be a great spot for us to move over into some Q&A. Uh, we've got some fantastic questions coming in from our live audience, and uh, let me grab a couple of those. And uh, let's maybe begin with this one. Uh, Ryan Dahl, speaking of some older approaches, I, uh, I'd like to get your impression on this one. Ryan says, one tip that we teach our sales team is mirroring the tonality of the client. Are there key points you touch on at seventh level related to mirroring? We train on tonality. Okay. So mirroring, uh, it's a concept I'm familiar with, uh, but we, we, we train more on using tonality. And I think there's, there, it's different ways of looking at the same thing. Um, it, it's certainly an important principle. I think like if, if someone's the, the, the problem with mirroring is this, if someone's going really fast and you try to keep up with them and you can't slow them down, then the, the, the conversation, could go off into the wilderness, into the weeds. Uh, so keeping someone like out of the weeds on track is going to help your sales process go a little bit better. But yeah, mirroring, mirroring can be good. Uh, but really, we, we train on like tonality, what it is, how to be aware of your own voice, how to be aware of how you're coming across. And um, so that we focus more on the tonality rather than the mirroring the prospect, if, if that makes sense, just to keep it kind of succinct. Yeah, I like that. Um, here's a question from Lindy. She's asking, are certain personalities better suited for this approach than others? Uh, or do you feel anyone could learn the skill set to be a seven figure producer? Anyone, any, all different personalities. And I'll, I'll share a funny story. Um, Jeremy, I think when he got his first sales job, they told him he didn't have the ideal personality for sales and that he wasn't cut out for it. And that lit a fire under him and he learned the right skills. And now he's probably the best salesperson in the world. Okay. Um, if not one of them. So, um, and he, so this works for different types of personalities. Even if you never saw yourself as a salesperson, you don't like being a salesperson. This works for all sorts of personalities. Well, I, I think that's going to come as good news to a lot of our listeners. Thanks for sharing that. I, I, I tend to agree. I've learned over the years that it is, doesn't have to be the extroverted talkative type at all. In not fact, at all. Some, some outright in, introverts. Introverts can, can do very smart. well in sales, sometimes better than extroverts. They listen yeah. more. Yeah. Listen more, say less what, when they do speak, it, it, it's better thought out. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see here. There is another good question here too. Um, shine the light on urgency. I like that says Ken, uh, genus. Now, so that that's, that is a big one. I think we could even go deeper on that. How can you create more urgency? I know a lot of times when you're speaking with people who are mid-level in these enterprise companies, Hey, they, they've got to be involved, but it's not their necessarily their pocketbook. It is urgent, but like, Talk to maybe give us a little bit more on that. How can you discover and or create some urgency? Well, what is in it? What are the ramifications for that person if nothing changes? Is their job going to be more difficult? Are they, is the company going to have to downsize? Are they going to lay off people? There's always something driving someone. What's in it for them? Why do they even want to fix this? Is, are they up for promotion? And if they don't solve this and a problem gets worse, what happens then? Nothing happens. So finding the individual drivers of a person in that deal can be helpful. Uh, and, and consequence questions are huge for that. Like whoever you're asking, see what happens if you keep hemorrhaging funds through this ineffective advertising 
and you're not able to, 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 you know, stay above water, what would happen at that point? Yeah, that makes sense. So finding a gap and then consequence questions are how you can build urgency. Good stuff. Joshua asked this question, how important is marketing and sales support or sales enablement in the mix here? Marketing and sales are so important. They're such vital, intertwined, um, vital things to intertwine. Marketing helps sales more than you know. Um, sales relies on leads for marketing, but like when you have powerful marketing that reminds your prospects about your offer, it helps salespeople a ton with their pipeline. So if you have a, a company that's just constantly putting out training and content, staying in front of your customers and a salesperson in a conversation with some two months ago, that prospect might be like, I've been meaning to call that guy back. I really want to solve this problem. It actually helps your salespeople manage their pipeline and get more pipeline deals. Just having really good marketing to stay in front of people. So very, very important. Yeah. Uh, do you, I'll follow up on that for Joshua. Um, do, do you feel that that's typically lacking? I mean, is that an area that a lot of listeners on the call could maybe look at? How could we better integrate? Oh, yeah. And maybe, even ha maybe even have more like a unified pipeline approach because a lot, a lot of companies, especially these bigger companies, they're still siloed off, right? The whole the branding and marketing people are in different offices and they're different people. Um, is it, are, you, are you seeing that that's – is there a shift? And if there's not – if that hasn't happened in a given company, do you have recommendations for making that shift, getting it more integrated? The two departments need to talk. They're so co-reliant, co more than many companies realize. Like at seventh level, we're very good about this. Like we do keep them siloed, but we communicate a lot. Like are the leads good? What do we need to change so that marketing can provide better leads? And marketing does a fantastic job staying in front of people. And so our sales team will, will have prospects that just say, hey, you know what? I was thinking about this. I keep seeing Jeremy. You know what? I really want to make a change. That's just an example. But I would encourage anyone here with a company, uh, if you have the ability to just put content out there, it, it has positive effects more than many people realize to help the salespeople close more deals to stay top of mind. So yeah, they should they should work like this for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you can, if you want to go ahead and, and uh, build on the previous plug, Jocelyn is asking. She's very interested to know more information on the ultimate training you mentioned. Is the best place just to go to the seventh level uh, website? You could. It might be easier just to book in, you know, a call with me if you were wanting to do that. I can kind of give you a lay of the land. I'm, I'm happy to provide my, my booking link here. So that would be the easiest way. If if you're not quite okay. ready for that, totally fine. I encourage you to join our Facebook group. You can kind of network, ask people. Um, the ultimate training. So, uh, you know, in terms of like what the investment is, it ranges it. We have training options that are pretty basic. Like I have a $7 one for you guys. That's like one cheapest one. Our more advanced trainings range from like 3k all the way up to like 15, 25k it just depends what your goals are, what you need and what's lacking. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I would encourage you to just get on a call with someone like me from our team, just so we can actually understand if we can help you and then what you need, how we can help you get there. Great stuff. Well, and if you want to go ahead and put that book, uh, chat, chat that uh, booking link over to me, uh, oh, yeah, certainly provide that as a listener, no problem at mm -hmm. all. Cool, be happy to do that. Um, well, this is great stuff, and the good news is there is uh, a, it's a never ending need for salespeople. There's a lot of conversation when, in the era of chat GPT and all of that AI of, of many different kinds that somehow salespeople will become obsolete. And I'm in agreement with other uh, thought leaders that. If anything, it just means you've got to be that much more skilled, but you're still going to be very much needed. The more skilled you are, the more longevity you can have. Would you agree with that? hundred oh, percent. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, people like e even with chat GPT, they're going to crave human interaction and, you know, technology will change the job of the sales professional. Probably it'll make the job probably a lot more efficient. Uh, it, it's possible that maybe not as many sales reps will be needed, but Sales reps will always be needed because you, you can't replace human motivation and drive. And people, I think at the end of the day, they want to work with someone. They want some sort of human interaction. Like we don't want to all just talk to robots. I know when I talk to a, to a, to a chat box, all I'm doing is screaming for a person. And I believe that people will <laughs> yeah. want that and continue to want that. If the salespeople are, are, you know, fun and easy to talk to, which we train people how to be. Well, and I, I think you put your finger on something um, that as we've gotten more and more and more and more technology based, that lack of human touch and interaction, I think, could make you stand out, right? If you have a sales process that allows for more of that, I de speaking to the marketers on my listening listenership, uh, there's an opportunity for you in your pipeline. If you're if your speed to lead is not just a bot, but an actual human that's reaching out to me, you're gonna get you're gonna get my attention. Mm -hmm. So I, I resonate with what you said there, Chris. Awesome. Um, 
So here's a question from Joshua. It kind of it, it kind of occurred to me earlier too. So, I mean, not every opening out there is going to have the potential for a sales producer to make a million bucks. And I guarantee a lot of the listeners are saying, "Where can I find these openings?" Like I'm all about it. Do you have recommendations on that part? Yeah, I'm actually considering starting uh, a Facebook group that actually educates salespeople on the landscape of that. Uh, and what I'm going to start doing is actually interviewing people from different industries to show them the good, the bad, the ugly, what people can make, what they make on average, because I think that's just lacking. So um, so the short answer is you're not usually going to find it just like with a job posting because they're not going to advertise you can make a million bucks. What happens is someone exceptional comes in there, a few people, and they can do that. There are vehicles where that's easier and where that's more difficult. Um, but it's a lot of the best sales jobs are not even found on job boards, although some are. Um, I, I can tell you that solar right now, guys are making great money. You can make a million bucks in solar, um, financial services, insurance, if you're good. You know, sales is either the hard, highest paid or the lowest paid profession, depending on how good you are. Well, and, and in those areas, those industries you just named, you, you, it wouldn't be just any old job selling low cost insurance. You probably are talking about learning the art of selling larger types of products to more wealthy individuals, correct? Well, wealthy individuals or companies. Yeah. Or companies, yeah. Well, and with solar too, right? If you can go enterprise or municipal, that's where the big bu big bucks are with solar, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, a lot of great cl uh, clues as well as golden nuggets dropped on our listenership today. Uh, Chris, I really appreciate you being on the show. It's been a great ride and you've been really real value to us. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Well, and if you've been enjoying the content and the guests that, we, that we've been having here on our show, you can check out any of our previous guests by going and finding the Evolved Sales Leader Podcast, wherever you like to go get podcasts, whether that be Spotify, Apple iTunes, or wherever that might be. And a big shout out to our sponsor, Overpass.com. They are the leading resource for finding talent at a high level of quality very quickly. If you need five SDRs to grow your tech startup and you need them by last Tuesday. Well, you can do it by next Tuesday by opening your free account at overpass.com and the system will instantly send you appropriate opportunities to interview highly qualified and skilled individuals that can work the phones and create pipeline for your company. Check them out overpass.com and just see how great they are to work with. Well, for the whole team here, I'm signing off. That's going to do it for this weekend. Thank you to you, the listener, that's making the show such a success. We continue to grow by leaps and bounds. Come on back the next time here on LinkedIn Live. Bring a friend, and we'll see you when you get here then. Take care, everybody.